Okay, good evening. I believe Dr. Chip is grading me. So, hello, Dr. Chip. How's it going? Um, Dr. McGinnis, I guess if you look at this, hello to you as well. Um, so, of course, you guys know what this is. Going over common conditions uh, in secondary schools. Um, presenting it all at one time just to make it a little bit easier for upload um, and kind of free your view player. Uh, I did my best to kind of break up the sections by different slide layouts just to help you out a little bit. Uh, but without further ado, since this is a ooh, like 50 slide thing, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so of course, this is common conditions in the secondary school setting. That's where I'm looking to get uh, a job. I'm very hopeful that I'll be able to land my own school uh, here at the end of the semester. Well, come on. There we go. Okay, so starting off strong, very typical mechanism of injury for high school students, the lateral ankle sprain. Um, so, mm -hmm. Got a little picture here to show the most common tendons that are affected by that, uh, both the ATFL and the TCL or CFL. Um, but they're the most common injury uh, in physically active population, not just athletes. Uh, and it takes up about 90% of all ankle sprains. Uh, the PTFL is also uh, included in those injuries not quite as common as your ATFL and your CFL, uh, and they're represented in classes of either class one, two, or three, uh, depending on the severity of that injury. And we'll talk about it that as we go. So the mechanism of injury, typical mechanism for um, a ankle sprain, lateral ankle sprain is going to be plantar flexion with inversion. So having that foot really pressed all the way down to the floor, rolled over the top, and then some inversion forcing those ligaments to pull. Um, you have the forceful inversion of the foot causing stress on the lateral ankle ligaments is what leads to that. So, <clears throat> so we're trying to get that uh, little video box where it's in a better spot. For the recording. So moving on, our signs and symptoms uh, with those separated out by grade, as I said, uh, you've got the mild pain and disability, slight re uh, reduction in ability to bear weight, point tenderness, um, all those very light issues at the grade one. Um, usually people are going to be able to walk on this, they're going to get up, keep going, uh, you might tape them up and get them back in the game. Grade two, you're going to have a patient starting to report that feeling of a pop. Uh, you're going to start seeing that moderate pain. You're going to see some disability, so they're going to have a harder time walking. Um, they're going to be really tender in the area. You might start to see edema and uh, bruising into that area, as well as you're going to start getting your positive special tests, like your anterior drawer and your Taylor tilts. Grade threes are severe pain. Um, around the area of the malleolus. Weight bearing is not going to happen. You're going to start to see that discoloration very quickly. Um, you're still getting your positive anterior drawer and your tailored tilts, uh, but those injuries uh, can also lead to kind of a dislocation of the talus as well. So kind of slide that whole ankle joint out of place because you've lost the integrity completely of the ligaments that normally would be holding everything where it belongs. Uh, the special test that you can use, I've already mentioned the anterior drawer and the Taylor tilt test. Uh, the other one that can be used is a Clyder's test. The Clyder's test is also good to help you figure out uh, with that lateral ankle sprain. Uh, did you get some high ankle involvement? So that syndesmosis in between the tibia and the fibula. Um, so your sensitivity, specificity are there. I'm not necessarily going to bog you down with that information. Just because we've got a lot to cover and get over. Um, basically, your anterior toror and your tailor tilt test, um, those are going to be very good for ruling in a lateral ankle sprain, not so great for ruling out 
uh, that that issue. So just because you get a negative on those doesn't mean you haven't sprained your ankle. Remember, we can grade that one to three. Uh, you might start getting positives at two and three, but you could still have a grade one sprain and those tests come back normal. So with all of that, keep it moving. Okay, so treatment plan. So we have broke these treatment plans down by phases of healing. Um, at the top of all of these pages, you're going to see the power mark for which this treatment phase uh, would fall within, uh, but also understand that general protocols don't do it by uh, phase of healing. Uh, and so these timelines are going to be also kind of pushed a little bit molded together because the treatment, uh, the inflammation phase, proliferation phase, maturation phase, they all kind of intermingle a little bit. So these are going to be kind of mixed together a little bit, but I'll do my best to explain that as we go. So our goals in this first section of the phase is really just to control the swelling control, um, how much that ankle's getting used. That way we can protect it. Uh, we want to make sure they're spending a lot of time with that foot elevated to help relieve some of that swelling uh, and some compression so that it doesn't get too much swelling in there. Um, <clears throat> so with that ankle sprain, early phases, you need that inflammation phase to take part. Uh, so you don't want to cut it off too soon uh, by icing it down right away unless the pain's just really unbearable. Um, but you want to give it some time to kind of get through that initial inflammation phase and then work that swelling out of the area to help it heal. Uh, some of the ways that you can work swelling out of that area are going to be your high volt pulsed simulation um, and then your muscle milking electrical simulation. So basically this is just like a motor level stimulation where you are going to help those muscles contract to kind of work that lymphatic system and move uh, that swelling from the foot up into the body to be reworked. Um, you can also work game ready um, into this. It's going to get you some compression, some cold, uh, and kind of help limit that swelling as well. Again, a lot of research now is showing that you don't want to ice too quickly because you need that inflammation phase to happen to properly heal and that the more you slow down the inflammation phase, the longer your treatment time and your healing time is going to take up. Exercises that we're going to be doing in this phase, um, we're protecting the ankle, but that does not mean we don't want to move it. Uh, so we're looking for elevated, uh, unweighted exercises like your ankle circles, pumps, ABCs. Uh, you can do your isometric holds, so just having them push against your hand, against a wall, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, you can get into, this won't be right away, but this is going to be kind of where I'm talking about transitioning through um, the rehab plan, you can get into your seated towel scrunches, uh, seated toe yoga, things like that to go along with um, your rehab at that point. So during the proliferation phase, uh, so this kind of takes you from hour seven all the way up to day 24. A long period of time kind of gets you through that initial treatment phase uh, and helps you transition your way to really getting back to that return to play uh, section of treatment into the maturation phase. But our goals in this are going to be to restore range of motion and to make sure we're working on early ankle strengthening. So here uh, you can kind of get into working some of your combo. So you're going to place a pad on the ATFL uh, and then use your ultrasound over the lateral malleolus. This is just going to help reduce some of that swelling uh, as well as kind of just help remote healing in the area. Uh, now you can get into your NIMS uh, electrical stimulation. Uh, this is going to be another one of those ways where you're getting muscle stimulation to help move um, that swelling out of the area as well as just kind of keep those electrical signals sending the way they're supposed to while your ankle's not really able to move that well. Uh, therapeutic uh, exercises during this phase, okay, we're working our isometric holds again. We're working our way from those isometric holds into four-way bands and continuing to progress. We're now doing our seated towel scrunches. Uh, we're going to be doing our seated toe raises, seated calf raises. Uh, and like I said, you're just transitioning to full weight bearing. 
Um, you're going from hour seven all the way up to day 24. So there's a lot of transition that can happen during that time frame. Uh, and there's a lot that you're going to be working on during that part. In your maturation phase, so your 72 hour uh, end of inflammation up to one month and beyond. Uh, so this is where you're going to finally get that uh, tissue to start really pulling together, really growing back the way it was supposed to be, uh, making up for that. So our goals here is to fully restore strength. It's to restore full function and make sure that um, they are ready to go back to sport. The modalities that we can start to use in this section, you can get into kind of using your Russian E-STEM. Um, this is going to help with getting those muscle activations so you can reach your in range of motion. Um, you can use this as an active assisted um, contraction kind of deal where they feel the ramp happen and they make a muscle or they make a movement and then that electrical stimulation is going to take their muscle further into that movement uh, and just kind of reset that. Uh, you can also start working some hot water submersion um, this is just going to help relax that area, help with um, kind of loosening everything up uh, so that as you're doing those exercises, you can get those in range of motions uh, and kind of work on restoring that strength. During this phase, now we're working the full weight bearing. We're working our squats, lunges. Uh, we can do double and single leg balance on stable and unstable surfaces. We're going to be transitioning into our running plyometrics and our sport specific training um, as we get further along in this process. So some of those activities, they can look like going um, into, say you have a volleyball player, so now you're starting your runs, uh, you're jumping to make sure that their jump progressions are proper. Uh, and once you know they're jumping correctly, now we're gonna take them to the net. We're gonna put up the volleyball net. We're going to actually have them practice their approach if they're an outside hitter. We're going to have them practice their approach if they're a middle blocker. Um, or if you've got your libero, we're going to make sure that they've got the ability to push off of those feet nice and even or from weird angles so that they can get out and down to the floor to get that ball back. Moving on, our ways of preventing uh, and maintaining uh, an ankle sprain um, before it happens. Um, there is some research for prophylactic taping and bracing. So um, before an injury, uh, when going into extreme competition, going ahead and getting those ankles taped or braced, um, whether that be a lace-up brace or, you know, just normal taping methods, um, even without an injury, uh, you can get personalized orthotics that are going to make some corrections in your ankle setup so if you have too much pronation or you have too much supination in your foot high a low arch those orthotics can help make up for some of those shortcomings so that while you're competing that doesn't make you more likely to have an ankle injury uh, proper shoe size is a big deal uh, in making sure that you are less likely for an ankle injury as well as you can kind of do some prehab if you will or post rehab if you've already had the injury, uh, just your typical ankle uh, exercise, exercise programs. So again, working wide balance, um, working your full weight bands just to strengthen all of that, toe raises, heel raises, so on and so forth, just doing those ahead of time and or to maintain once you've had an injury. Surgical interventions that can be used uh, with a lateral uh, ankle injury. So once that ATFL or the CFL, any of those ligaments have been injured, it then becomes a thing where you kind of have to reconnect them so that uh, the ankle joint is more stable. Um, there is also a good chance that with a lateral ankle sprain uh, that is bad enough to require surgery that you also uh, could get some involvement of the perineal tendons, uh, and that's what you see in figure three here, uh, just talking about how those perineal tendons often get injured along with that lateral ankle. So that could be something that they go in and try to clean up a little bit as well. Um, 
So your indications are going to be chronic ankle instability that cause pain or prevent an individual from completing a normal task of daily living. Um, and then your contraindications are just individuals that even without that ATFL, like they can get back and do their thing. Um, the paranoial tendons are fine and strong enough to kind of hold that ankle together overall so that they can do their normal thing. Maybe they're no longer trying to play sport. They're just running around the house uh, doing work, maybe playing a little bit with their kids, but they're not pushing themselves to a point that it's detrimental that they don't have those ligaments. Uh, if you don't have to have the surgery, it's a lot easier on the body to not have the surgery. It'll adjust. It'll get used to it. Uh, and then in figure four here, you can see some of the methods that they use to uh, repair that from just stitching the ligaments back together. Um, they can sometimes put a little like sheath over the ankle to kind of hold those together or hook the tendon that's left and is properly attached into uh, little hooked spots on where they should be uh, attaching where the other part has torn away. So that brings us to the end of our lateral ankle sprains uh, and now has us moving into medial tibial stress syndrome or shin splints. Again, another very common injury to see in our high school students, um, especially when you think about coming from if they're a single sport athlete and they go a whole year. Uh, don't really do anything outside of the sport. They just are playing high school sports. Uh, they take, they go through the year and then they come back at the next year, haven't really done a lot, uh, and think they're going to just jump into practice without really ramping up. And then they start getting that shin splint or they have old shoes or they change the surface of the track or the tennis courts. Things like that can all lead to this, uh, but very common. Uh, just a repeated microtrauma of the tibial bone associated with the peri uh, periostitis uh, and caused by impact sports where you run, jump, uh, any of the above. And then usually you see it with pain that localizes to the anterior part of the shins, uh, kind of in those red zones that you can see on the picture here. So your common mechanism of injury when it comes to shin splints, um, competing or completing repetitive tasks um, with associated risk factors. So that could be weakened leg muscles, that could be shoes with little support, training errors such as just bad form, um, hard surfaces. Uh, this goes back to maybe you go from practicing on dirt or grass and then you have a long hard practice where you're running on asphalt. Um, overtraining, so you just never take a break and you're constantly pushing yourself to the limit. Uh, you have a navicular drop, which is also common when you have flat feet or pes planus, uh, and then a lack of ankle plantar flexion or dorsiflexion. So that's going to affect the way your body's able to move, uh, puts more stress on the muscles and on the shins uh, to absorb that since the ankle can't do its job correctly. Epidemiology, uh, it occurs in 10 to 15% of all runners, 30% of military recruits, and accounts for up to 60% of all conditions that cause pain in the lower leg. Um, that pain is localized to the anterior part of the shins before, during, and after activity. That does not have to be all three of those. Sometimes it's just before, sometimes it's during, sometimes it's during and after, uh, sometimes before and after, but eases off during activity, that changes. And typically is separated into four grades. So your grade one uh, pain that occurs after activity. You wrap up activity for the day, shins start to hurt. Pain occurring before and after activity, but not affecting performance. So you know the pain's there, but as you start to warm up, uh, you stop noticing it, you perform just fine. But once you wind down afterwards, you start to feel that pain again. Pain occurring before, during, and after. Uh, it's grade three, so now that pain never goes away. You notice that when you're not practicing and when you're about to practice, you notice it during practice and you notice it after it and you feel like you can't get as much out of uh, the, your legs when you're in practice. And then you've got your grade four where the pain has become so severe that pain is impossible to take part in.
<clears throat> so the special tests that can be used here, there's not a lot going on uh, as far as actual special tests to be done, but uh, the ways that it's typically found are going to be a very detailed medical history, uh, specifically asking questions about um, activity load. So how much are they doing? Have they increased the amount of work that they've been doing uh, compared to, you know, two, three weeks ago? Are they wearing old shoes? All of these things are going to help with that. You're going to get your physical examination uh, where you can see some pain reproduced uh, with the palpation of the posterior tibial uh, medial tibial border. Um, it'll also usually have an absence of like swelling, uh, erythema, uh, redness, uh, or a loss of a distal pulse. Those are not typical of MTSS. Uh, those are more so typical of your compartment syndrome, things that you, you would be a little bit more urgent uh, with the treatment of. Uh, so those are things that kind of help you rule in, rule out some of those differential diagnoses when someone comes in and is like, oh, my shins just really hurt. Um, <clears throat> once you have that detailed medical history, uh, a lot of what's going to verify that is going to be your CT scan or an MRI, uh, as well as the DEXA bone density scans. Uh, again, you can see the sensitivities, specificities, uh, wasn't able to find likelihood ratios for any of those three. Um, on the slide... The Kliger's test can also be used, uh, again, that kind of works because as you push that ankle up into uh, dorsiflexion and external uh, rotation, you are forcing the shin apart uh, and kind of get some of that pain reproduced there. Um, not specifically for MTSS, but it can be used to help uh, get an idea. And then your percussion bump um, your bumper squeeze or your per per percussion compression test, um, those again a little bit more tailored towards um, fractures, but uh, are there as a way to use and kind of rule in, rule out what you're working with so you can verify, hey, I don't have a fracture. So this seems like it would be more so towards MTSS uh, as a issue. So moving on, treatment plan, the goals of the inflammation phase is going to be to reduce inflammation, pain, and point tenderness. Uh, it's hard to do much when you have that going on. Uh, some of the modalities you will use here are going to be the ice cups. So you want to freeze ice. You'll use that to massage the shin for seven minutes. Uh, you can do that two to three times a day and then do static stretching along with that. Uh, same amount of time. Orthotics and taping are going to help with that. So orthotics will reduce navicular drop. Um, this semester I've actually had a lot of opportunities to do this. Uh, I've had about three, three or four of my tennis players um, struggling with some MTSS type symptoms um, and have had a lot of success with uh, a navicular sling and the typical teardrop arch tape. Uh, to kind of help them get through practices and not feel as much pain. So all of those are good things to add in and help treat with them. Uh, so those things you're going to be doing on exercise-wise, you're going to be doing a lot of calf stretches, a lot of uh, tip anterior stretches, uh, and then you're going to start working some of those more global muscles with your four-way hips, your dead bugs, uh, trying to really strengthen that whole uh, lower chain in the process. During your proliferation phase, uh, your goals are going to be to resolve symptoms and return the athlete to walking, jogging, and running. Um, ways that you can do this, uh, you can do general cold applications 20 minutes before and after activity. Uh, this could be ice baths, whirlpools, this could just be bags of ice. Um, do any of that ultrasound uh, at a low intensity, so it was 0.5 to 0.075. Um, and that's just going to kind of help shake up those tissues, um, hopefully help get them to lay down and realign properly uh, and get some of that aggravation out. Uh, at this point, you're going to be starting to work some of your four-way banded ankle, your towel scrunches, marble pickups, heel to toe walks, toe walks, uh, all of those kind of deals as well as starting to progress towards your proprioception as well as your walk, jog, run progression. Um, so... As you watch them do proprioceptive stuff, as you watch them walk, jog, run, you want to start really addressing any gait 
issues that they have, uh, any of those differences uh, that are there, you want to make sure you're taken care of. Then finally, in your maturation phase, so your goal is really just to get them back on the court, uh, get them back on the field, whatever the case may be. Um, Modality-wise, really not anything you've got to change. You're going to continue to use cold therapy. You're going to continue to uh, just kind of take care of the athlete, however that may be, whether that's taping, bracing, so on. Uh, and then your therapeutic ex uh, exercises, this is where you really want to start to get into your sport-specific drills uh, and trainings. Uh, if you're talking to your cross-country kids, this is where you're starting to let them push out mile and a half, two mile, three mile uh, runs at a time um, so that you can evaluate how their progression is going. Ways to prevent and maintain um, once or before injury slash after it's happened. Again, or those orthotics and arch taping uh, to present, prevent the excessive pronation or that navicular drop. Uh, you can do your lower body strengthening so that all of the mechanics are functioning properly. You want to use any therapeutic exercises uh, that help treat MTSS. So again, you're stretching uh, all of that good stuff. You want to make sure that the athletes wearing proper footwell wear. So if this is a cross-country kid, like there's a certain number of miles you can put on a pair of shoes before it's time to get a new pair. Uh, tennis. This semester, one of my tennis athletes started the semester, had really bad shin splints, and walked in with tennis shoes that had holes in the toes. That shoe's not doing her any good. I'm probably part of the reason why she's having those problems. And then, again, checking those gait mechanics and increasing their level of activity slowly so that their body has time to build up and get used to it. Uh, luckily with MTSS, there's really no surgical interventions that are necessary um, unless it progresses to compartment syndrome or severe stress fractures, but those are their own individual um, pathologies, so we're not going to talk about them here. Next up, uh, the, I would think, uh, the king of high school injuries, uh, the ACL sprain. Um, typically, you're going to see this as a full ACL rupture, but I covered kind of sprains as a general rule of thumb um, and then worked my way up from there. So as you guys know, the anterior cruciary ligament is just a ligament in the knee that helps prevent anterior translation of the tibia uh, and it is considered the most serious of the ligament injuries that can be uh, obtained while playing sports. Now, there's not a specific MOI that is a sure tell sign every round. Uh, most people associate the non contact uh, plant and twist motion with the most normal MOI, uh, it, and it is, it counts for 80% of ACL injuries, so it is by far your most common way you'll see that. Uh, there's also your direct contact method. This might be a little more uh, likely in your football, uh, so on and so forth, because as the athlete is slowing down, they get that foot planted, and then they take a contact on the lateral aspect of the knee that kind of forces that anterior translation uh, past what the L uh, ACL can manage. And then you have your indirect contact. Sometimes this is what you would see in a sport like soccer where there is contact, but it's not necessarily forced right to the knee itself. Uh, so while two players are taking a kind of tackling each other for the ball, uh, trying to keep each other off of the ball, uh, it just leads to the right storm of force on that knee causing that issue. Uh, it's most commonly found in female athletes um, and then also in those with anatomical malalignments, a BMI above 25 uh, and an age under 18 or equal to 18. And then also a family history of ACL injuries. So if you have a family history of that, that can make a difference as well. Your signs and symptoms uh, that go along with this, um, athletes going to report feeling a pop uh, in the knee and then be unable to use the leg or unwilling to use the leg. Um, they're going to complain that it felt like their knee shifted if they are trying to get up and walk on it or during the fall 
Uh, you might see immediate swelling, pretty typical to see pretty quick swelling of that knee. Uh, and then you're also going to see that kind of tail pale hands grasping the knee um, motion. And a lot of times that is because they feel like their tibia has slid forward uh, where it does not belong, which is exactly what happens uh, in that motion. And you can see some examples of that sometimes in some of your professional sports where you have replays and videos that kind of show that tibia slide forward like that. So your typical special test, uh, the most common you'll see is going to be your anterior drawer test. Uh, you're going to see the Lockman's test, and then you're going to see the pivot shift. Um, now, Pivot shift is probably not the nicest of the special tests, certainly not the first thing you pull out, um, but it is one of the most profoundly uh, used as far as being able to fully see that tibia shift uh, and know that you do not have an ACL attached in there. Um, still have your specificity, sensitivity, and your likelihood ratios in there. Um, Generally, all of these tests are good at ruling in a ACL injury, um, not as good at ruling out, which is fine. Um, I picked these tests for their ability to rule in an ACL injury. Uh, it's usually pretty, pretty obvious when you're dealing with that, so you don't necessarily have a ton that you're trying to rule out as far as differential diagnosis. So getting into the treatment plan, uh, with that treatment plan, your goals are going to be minimizing swelling uh, during the inflammation phase. You want to minimize swelling, pain, uh, you want to minimize he hemorrhage uh, after surgery, you want to establish and maintain extension, quad control, regional knee flexion, and neuromuscular control. So pretty quickly, um, if you have the full rupture and you're not doing a conservative treatment for a lower level sprain, you want to make sure you're getting that knee moving, um, making sure that it, you're taking care of getting all of the range of motion that you can out of that knee during the time. Um, some of the modalities that can be used, the constant passive motion machine, or CAPM, um, and that is just a machine that you strap the leg into and it nice and easy bends and extends the leg out within a set range of uh, parameters depending on what you have. So if you've got someone that can go to 10 degrees extension up to 90 degrees flexion, well, it'll just run them back and forth between those numbers uh, to kind of help get that leg used to it. And then over time, you extend the numbers out so that it goes from zero all the way up to 120, if you so please. Um, but you get to do that. Uh, you get ice. You can do 10 to 20 minutes after rehab. Uh, you can also just ice throughout the day and help with pain if it's there. Your exercises you're doing early and often uh, with an ACL injury, your quad sets, hamstring stretches, calf stretches, uh, foot elevated, uh, passive extension stretch. So that's just going to be kicking the foot up, letting the knee hang uh, and get as straight as it can. Straight leg raises, as long as they have enough quad control that the foot doesn't lag, you want to get those going. Uh, and then, of course, heel slides, typical uh, stuff there. During your proliferation phase, um, your goals are going to be to try to achieve a normal gait pattern. You want to get them back to walking as quickly as possible. Um, just helps with long-term effective um, healing. And then you want to... Restore hamstring and quad strength. You want to make sure you get full flexion during this time period, and you want to start light functional activity. Um, during this phase, once you're out of that initial inflammation phase, this is where you can start to work your Russian E-stem to help the brain and the muscle reconnect to each other. Um, just to overpower that blood mental block that's there telling the quad that it can't contract fully. Your therapeutic exercises, a lot of what's on the previous page, uh, and that's kind of how all of the treatment plans are working. Uh, so as you do the treatment plans, um, everything from the prior ones are still fair game. As you move along, you're just going to drop some, add some new ones as it goes.
Um, but at this point, you want to do gait training so that they're transitioning to full weight bearing. You want to work your mini squats, your step ups, leg extensions, leg curls, uh, four way hip and ankle, just because that uh, foot hasn't been doing its normal mechanics. So adding in some four way ankle and some strengthening is just going to help um, the whole lower chain work properly. Uh, you can start doing some stationary bike to return your um, cardio conditioning as well as kind of work moving that leg through the range of motion. And then you want to start working your way through proprioception. So working your balance two leg and single leg and then on stable versus unstable uh, settings as you move along. Moving into the maturation phase, uh, the goals here are going to be to return to sport participation. Uh, so at this point, you can start using that neuromuscular electrical stim. Uh, and what this will do is help you get uh, more of that kind of pulsed um, electrical stimulation. should help it feel nice, as well as just, again, help kind of reconnect that. And you can start using some ultrasound uh, as well. Uh, and that's just going to help with uh, getting that scar tissue to kind of realign uh, and smooth out any um, scarring that might be in the knee from the surgery. Your therapeutic exercises, now we're starting to get to the fun stuff. All right, we're doing our jump training. We're working our way up from walking to running. Uh, and you're also starting to get to do your sports-specific drill and your return to play testing. So you like your less, uh, things like that. So... During this phase, uh, this is where you really start uh, checking on that athlete, making sure they're doing the right things uh, so that they can be successful in their return to play. So some of the prevention and maintenance. So for this section, I wanted to kind of talk more so about uh, what a ACL prevention program would look like. Um, and luckily from a systematic review that we used, for a project probably during the fall or no spring last spring either way um, you've got a ACL injury prevention program checklist that you can follow uh, that lets you know a how likely um, is it that the interventions you are providing are going to help prevent an ACL injury uh, but also kind of gives you a layout of what is the most likely groups that need this. Uh, and then of course here you just have some pictures uh, showing proper positioning and showing some exercises that are good to help strengthen the lower body uh, and kind of work the body to hold, maintain, hold and maintain proper alignment while in movement. Uh, so this can be done by anyone, but again, like I said, ACL injuries tend to be more so uh, happened to girls. So, as you can see, uh, that's why our girls are in the prevention program pictures here. Uh, maintenance wise, I mean, if you had an ACL injury, really anything you've done during your uh, treatment of the injury counts as maintenance. So, continuing to do some level of rehab, uh, whether that be upping the late stage rehab exercises, uh, whether that be through adding weight or adding reps, um, doing it at a faster pace, all of that still counts as ways to help maintain uh, proper alignment and proper um, technique there. Uh, some of your surgical interventions. Uh, so with that, uh, ACL reconstructions, they are going to select the graft type, whether that be an autograph uh, which is something from within your body, or an allograph, which tends to be a cadaver tendon. Um, and then they use the surgical technique of either using a single bundle or a double bundle reconstruction. So that is just, as you can see here, one band versus two bands. Uh, and then they either line it up as an anatomic or a non-anatomic position. Um, if the um, have the ability and it's not going to affect the physis, then they tend to go for an anatomic laydown. Uh, whereas if it's something, a young athlete that still is growing, they might go more so with a non-anatomic to leave that epiphysis alone so that it can continue to let that athlete grow appropriately. 
Um, sometimes they'll use a transtibial versus a femoral tunneling, uh, tunnel drilling method. Sometimes you kind of get a little bit of both. It just depends on the orthopedic surgeon that is doing the, doing the surgery and how they feel most comfortable. All right, AC joint sprains. Um, so the AC joint sprain, not as common as some of the other um, injuries in the PowerPoint, but still one that I feel like you see fairly well, especially with your football players, um, and is one of those things that I thought was good to refresh and know a little bit more about proper treatment of because I feel like they can be really nagging injuries if you don't have a good idea of what to look for when they happen and so on from that point. Uh, so it is the joint uh, where the clavicle meets the acromion um, and holds the shoulder together. And funny enough, it's the only bony connection that holds your arm onto your body. Everything else is ligament and muscle. So, your MOI. So, the most typical way you're going to see that happen is going to be direct contact to the tip of the shoulder, uh, forcing the acromion downward, backwards, and inwards while the clavicle is pushed into the rib cage. This can be a fall directly on the shoulder. This could be a hard tackle uh, coming from the side. Um, of course, you can never get away uh, from food being a typical mechanism of injury for the upper body, uh, so that is also very likely to cause it. Now, your epidemiology, it accounts for 9% of all shoulder injuries. Uh, it's the most common in sports with contact, uh, and it affects men at a higher rate than it does women, so 8.5 to 1. Um, and then your type 3 sprains are the most common, as you can see from our chart here, uh, in sport injuries. Um, sport injuries also take the largest toll when it comes to causes for um, AC joint injuries. So your signs and symptoms of AC joint um, kind of break it out into the f six grades. Uh, so if you have a grade one, you're going to get tenderness and discomfort at the AC joint, but you're not really going to see any disruption. You might get a little bit of a positive piano key sign where you kind of press on it and you notice that movement. Uh, grade two, you're going to start to get some tearing of the AC joint ligaments uh, and stretching it out. So keeping that tenderness, now you're really going to start to see a little bit more movement there when you test the AC joint. Um, grade three is where you're going to get full tear of <clears throat> both the uh, AC ligament and the CC ligament, which is the, oh, man, corcoclavicular ligament, yes. And then your grade four, uh, you're going to get posterior separation of the clavicle with the AC and CC ligaments torn. Grade five, same thing, full tear of all ligaments, uh, but you're also going to tear uh, some of the trapezius and the deltoid ligament attachment points as well. And then finally, uh, grade six, you get a fully torn um, ligaments and attachment points with the clavicular, with the clavicle being forced. Um, behind the brachioradialis tendon, uh, and that is a serious issue. Uh, when that when this happens, that clavicular can really clamp down on some important um, vessels and so on, cause some real issues. Uh, it is a emergency situation. So your special test, um, there are kind of two bundle of tests that you put together to get a decent uh, specificity and positive likelihood to rule in and a decent specificity or sensitivity and negative likelihood ratio to rule out uh, those injuries. So the Paxino sign uh, and the O'Brien's test when put together have a good specificity to help you rule in a 
uh, AC joint sprain, whereas the Paxinos sign comes back negative if you follow it up with a Hawkins Kennedy, and that is also negative. That gives you good sensitivity to say, okay, no, it's not an AC joint injury. I need to move on and look for something different. Your treatment plans, all right, you're looking for a reduction in pain and swelling as well as to protect the joint. You are can use um, ice. You can use NSAIDs twice a day, five to seven days or so. And then you're going to use a sling to help hold the shoulders in proper alignment so that that AC joint can heal. Uh, the exercises you're going to do during this phase are going to be passive range of motion with intolerance, uh, as well as some isometric holds um, at those low levels or at comfortable range of motions. In a inflammation phase, but an operative, so your like grades one through three tend to be conservative treatment, um, and then grades four through six are operative treatments. In an inflammation phase where you're doing an operative treatment, you're trying to keep that pain um, below a 3 out of 10. You want to minimize edema. You want to make sure the passive range of motion uh, is being worked at 70 degrees inflection, scaption, and abduction. Uh, and then, again, same modalities. You're using ice, insets, and a sling. And then you can start to do some... Uh, pendulums and some ball squeezes. Partially, this is going to be because during a surgical fix, you're going to have reattached that uh, clavicle to the acromion. So you want to try and get as much movement as you can maintain um, as early as possible so that the joint doesn't freeze up. You kind of have to be slower with the initial exercises when you're non-operative because that joint's still injured, you need to let it heal. Whereas you can kind of start being a little bit more aggressive when you have it surgically fixed because you now surgically fix the clavicle into the proper placement and the shoulder can afford a little bit of movement to avoid it sticking or getting frozen. Your proliferation phase uh, goals for non-operative treatment are going to be pain-free range of motion and early strengthening. Um, you want to start using kind of that inferential e-stem. So this is just low level e-stem that's going to help with some pain management, not going to cause any muscle contraction or any issues with that. And then you want to start doing your uh, active assisted range of motion as well as your scapular retraction protection, uh, some serratus anterior punches, uh, just your general shoulder uh, strengthening exercises are going to start to kick in there. Um, this could be where you start working a little bit of that uh, eyes, tees, wise, um, laying down on the table as well, uh, just to kind of start getting that range of motion as much as you can uh, in comfortable ranges. With an operative treatment during this phase, your goals are going to be to have no pain, no swelling. Uh, you want your active and passive range of motion, shoulder flexion, scaption, and abduction to be up to 90 degrees. Your external rotation out, uh, rotation out to 70 degrees in neutral, and your internal rotation full range of motion in neutral. So keeping that shoulder close to the body, you just want to be able to go where you're supposed to go. Again, you can use that inferential e-stem, kind of manage pain, help with that. Um, and then your therapeutic exercises still sticking within that active assisted range of motion, your scapular range of motions, uh, and just building strength in all of those planes. Once you get to the maturation phase, your goals are full range of motion and to return to sport specific play in the non operative protocols. Um, same modalities, uh, really, again, with it being an AC joint you're not necessarily retraining muscles because um, it's just a joint with ligaments. There's really not a lot of muscle uh, that goes there. So you're just kind of managing pain. Uh, your therapeutic exercises, now you're really getting into your eyes, T's and Y's. You should be progressing to weight. Uh, you want to be working your D1, D2 patterns uh, as resisted motions. You can do your banded rows, your proprioception uh, exercises. So like uh, working from a box down to the floor for shoulder taps, 
uh, to make sure that that's nice and strong. And then starting to work some sports specific, especially if you're overhead athlete, uh, you want to start working in uh, making sure they've got proper throwing mechanics, proper arms above uh, above head mechanics, whatever the case may be. In your operative protocol, uh, we're now looking for full range of motion to be achieved uh, in all planes. You want to make sure that the shoulder stability is achieved enough for sports. So that might be push-ups, whatever the case may be. Uh, and you want them to be full weight bearing as tolerated uh, by six months. Uh, this could be more difficult if you're talking about a gymnast because they need their arms to weight bear a lot. Uh, so it just depends on what your athlete does. Same thing on your modalities. We're just doing this for pain treatment, trying to help relax that area. Uh, and help those athletes um, still work in your eyes, T's and Y's up to being weighted, your D1, D2 patterns resisted, your banded rows, uh, all of those exercises still say the same proprioception. Um, so that's where going to be where you're catching and controlling a ball. Um, your sport specific training, again, just depends on what your sport is and what level of strength is needed for that position. Uh, your prevention and maintenance, uh, first thing you want to make sure you're focusing on is making sure that if it's a sport like football, you have proper fitting equipment, right? You want to make sure that it covers all of the necessary parts, and if needed, you add in extra padding to protect the AC joint um, once it's had an injury. Um, and then you want to work on your strength and mobility of the shoulder complex. Uh, and here I've just got a little... Um, shoulder exercise rehab sheet uh, to show kind of what that could look like. So you got some very simple exercises uh, that anybody could do just to add in a couple of options for how to make, how to do maintenance on that shoulder uh, to help it be strong and functional. Your surgical interventions, uh, there's two types of surgery that are going to be done. You're going to either have the hook uh, hook plate retention method where they pick a plate and they literally just screw that bad boy into the acromion uh, and the clavicle. Um, it's got some advantages, so it's possibly for early, it's uh, got possibility for early function uh, as well as treatment. Um, <clears throat> it's effective ca basic care. It's, it's a low technical requirement surgery, um, so it's harder for it to go wrong. And then there's no uh, residual form body after implant removal. So they are going to go back in and pull that out, though it's not in forever. Uh, disadvantage, it doesn't really take care of the glenohumeral uh, copathology. So if there's another issue going on with the shoulder, it really doesn't help with that any. Just gets that clavicle placed down. Uh, it can lead to uh, osteolysis, um, acromion fracture, as well as subacromial impingement. So when you add in extra space, you can close down that joint space, cause issues uh, with the brachial plexus as well. The other option being the uh, arthroscopic stabilization or pulley system technique, where they go in, uh, you get two small little pieces of metal, and then they use some string or stutures, and they pull everything back together to where it's supposed to be. Um, to keep that acromium and clavicular and uh, clavicle in the right place. Um, this one is good because it does let you treat uh, issues of glenohumeral copathologies, uh, and it's a single stage mental innovation surgery, um, and it is highly accepted by the patients. Um, I believe by that they really are just saying that it takes with patients well. It doesn't have a lot of um, other issues that are caused later on by that. Now, it is a very technical surgery, so it's difficult, it requires a specialist that does it a lot, um, and that could be hard to come across. Uh, the implant retention and implant irritation, sometimes that part's not going to take very well. Uh, and then you've got your possibility of fractures of the, either the clavicle or the coracoid uh, because they're kind of hooking everything in onto those things. But that pretty much wraps up our... AC joint bringing us to our final um, issue. It's been a long round of talking here, but let me wrap this up. Uh, you got your patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, 
pick this because, again, this is another one of those things that I've just seen a lot of this semester. Um, but patellofemoral pain syndrome is just a anterior knee pain uh, found in active adults, young adults, uh, involving the patella, the retinaculum, and the adjacent soft tissues, uh, but does not include any interarticular injuries, uh, generally believed to be a chronic overuse uh, mechanism of injury. But epidemiology, um, it's got a annual prevalence among adolescents of 28.9%, uh, and again causes pain in the anterior aspects of the knee while walking, running, descending, or ascending stairs. Um, and it causes that after practice achiness is what I've seen kids come in for. Uh, hey, I've been playing a lot of basketball or I've been doing a lot of whatever. My knees just really ache. It's kind of how I've seen it present. Uh, in my clinical practice. So your signs and symptoms, you're going to get gradual onset of anterior knee pain. You're going to get grinding sensation with movement. Uh, pain is typically going to be bilateral. Uh, you also are going to have complaints of locking or catching feeling after prolonged flexion of the knee. Uh, and you're also going to see some squinting patella, which you have a nice picture of right here, where the patellas, while everything else is straightforward, are facing inward. The special test that can be used for this, you've got your patella grind test, uh, patellar grind test, the Clark sign, and the patella apprehension test. i got a couple of pictures there to show you some of those. Um, didn't really have specificity sensitivity, but we did have our likelihood ratios, which is good. Um, being above one for our likelihood, uh, likelihood ratios for patella grind and Clark sign mean that it will work well enough uh, to rule in. Uh, and then with your patella apprehension test, you got a really good sensitivity, um, meaning that if you use the patella apprehension and you don't have an answer, it's probably not um, a patella femoral issue. Pain syndrome kind of deal. So treatment plan during your inflammation phase, your goals are going to be to moderate pain uh, and begin appropriate strength training exercises. The modalities you're looking to use are going to be ice uh, after exercise. You can use high volt pulse stimulation, um, and this is going to help get rid of some of that swelling, um, or at least help with, uh, if there is any swelling, help with that. Also just helps with some pain regulation. Uh, you can use the McConnell taping method so that where you kind of pull the patella back into its proper position so that it tracks the way it should uh, with tape. Uh, and then you're... Therapeutic exercises are really going to focus in on quad strengthening, so quad sets, isometric contractions of the quad, um, basically from 90 degrees of bend into full extension. Uh, extension. Uh, you're going to do some heel touchdowns, some toe raises, four-way hips, um, all of that stuff to kind of help strengthen that lower body. During the proliferation phase, now you are looking to increase your vastus medialis strength, uh, improve hamstring flexibility. So during this phase, modalities are still going to be your ice. You can still use that same high volt. Um, I didn't put it on here, but this would be another place where you could use that inferential uh, e-stem method, just kind of a little bit of a pain, uh, help with pain kind of deal. Uh, then you've got your McConnell taping uh, for patella tracking. Again, continuing that. Uh, you're going to start using the doorway to help stretch the hamstrings. You can use a belt. Uh, towel to do some seated hamstring stretch. You can get into your mini squats for lateral step ups. Uh, place a ball between the knees to squeeze uh, and do glute bridges. That's going to help activate the VMO. Straight leg raises with external rotation again going to help activate the VMO specifically as you do your strengthening. Finally, moving into your maturation phase, um, you're going to be looking to eliminate pain fully and return to activity. Um, at this point, you can start using some Russian e-stem where you're going to do some active-assisted um, exercises with the pads, more so running along that VMO, um, just to help the brain connect nice, strong contractions of that muscle and kind of strengthen it. And then your therapeutic exercises, you're working squats, lunges, you're going to do your return to play testing, uh, sport-specific drills, consistent eccentric loading of the quad and hamstring, all of that to really fully finish off your um, exercises and kind of get them ready to go back to sport. Uh, preventative maintenance, uh, well, we talked about the McConnell taping. 
uh, or bracing for patella maltracking that is not showing patellofemoral pain syndrome traits yet. Um, if you see someone that's got improper gait um, or a larger Q angle, those are things you can try to start working on before they get pain and issues. Uh, orthotics can help correct some of that. Uh, and then again, targeted strengthening of the VMO and quads as a whole. That can be done before and after. Um, wasn't a lot of information on how to prevent and maintain um, a uh, prevent and maintain. Uh, the injury. So some of these are kind of just looking at the research and the information that I found uh, for patellofemoral pain syndrome. This is just some of the things that I have assessed as helpful and would be useful ways to take care of it. Um, your surgical inter interventions um, not likely it does not happen often. Um, it does require very strict adherence to therapy for more than six months. Um, but you also, on top of the, the strict adherence, have to have one of the following uh, treatment issues. So you have to have malalignment. And again, that could be Q angle, that could be patellar, uh, tight lateral uh, retiniculum. And that's where you get your patella tilt or translation and then articular cartilage lesions uh, in that patella space. Um, if they feel that surgery is necessary, they're going to utilize an arthroscopic to get in there, look at everything, verify what needs to be done, where it needs to be done, uh, and then go from there. And then here in our little table, uh, these are just some of the procedures that can be done for um, patellofemoral pain syndrome. Uh, basically, just looking to correct malalignments uh, and kind of help get the joint to properly work the way that it should. So, managed to wrap that up just over an hour, which I'm surprised. I thought it was going to take me longer than that to present. Um, but, references are right here found at the end. I um, hope that you have enjoyed your time listening to this and that I wasn't too monotone so that uh, it's not terrible to listen back to. Um, appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great day whenever you get around to listening to this. Thanks.